Buenas tardes a todos. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Mi nombre es Soledad Gutiérrez y soy comisaria de Primera 21 en Madrid. Y quisiera agradecerles a todos, al Museo Nacional de Isipo Mimisa, el acogernos para esta mesa redonda en la que vamos a hablar de lo que yo creo que es una de las cuestiones, una de las grandes urgencias de nuestro tiempo, que es el, la urgencia de la crisis climática. Y vamos a intentarla desde la perspectiva que mejor conocemos o que más trabajamos nosotros, que es desde la práctica artística. Defendiendo o mostrando esa capacidad que tiene el arte contemporáneo, la práctica física contemporánea, para ser una herramienta en la lucha contra el cambio climático, para ser un agente de cambio y para ayudarnos a pensar de otra manera las cosas a las que nos enfrentamos en nuestro día a día. Para ello tenemos un panel que yo creo que es especialmente interesante y tenemos cuatro personas en las que el cambio climático, la lucha por eh, una concienciación y por una, más que una concienciación, el siguiente paso, ¿no? el, el generar una herramienta de pensamiento, de cuestionamiento crítico que nos ayude a repensar y a proponer soluciones a los problemas de nuestro, de nuestro día a día está muy presente. En primer lugar está... Francesca Pisa Mimisa, que es la, la fundadora y presidenta de TVA21. La práctica de la fundación desde sus inicios, cuando se creó en 2002, es intentar conseguir un enfoque multidisciplinar que ayude a pensar, a enfrentarnos a las urgencias de nuestro tiempo. Y yo creo que piezas como la de John Gerard, que también está en la mesa, que también está con nosotros hoy, Western Flag, que está presente en el patio del museo durante el tiempo que dura la COP y es una de las razones por las que estamos aquí y luego iremos a ella, eh, son fundamentales. Está con nosotros también José Luis de Vicente, que es comisario e investigador digital, que trabaja en los espacios del arte, la tecnología, el diseño, la ciencia y la innovación y que investiga el impacto actual y futuro de la tecnología a través de artefactos, objetos y narrativas que crean escenarios sociales y políticos emergentes. Son proyectos también muy antidisciplinares y crean contextos para la colaboración y el diálogo entre artistas, diseñadores, arquitectos, tecnólogos, científicos, activistas y comunidades. Hace poco hemos podido ver o hemos podido disfrutar en Madrid, en Matadero, del Festival Tentacular, del que es codirector y también participa en varios proyectos con el Festival Sonar. Luego con nosotros también está Alexandra de Sibinsa, que es una artista, que es uno de los valores humanos que forman el diseño, la ciencia, la tecnología y la naturaleza a través de arte, a través de trabajos artísticos, escritos y proyectos transitoriales en los que nos habla del impulso humano, y yo creo que es también uno, es un elemento fundamental del impulso humano para construir un mundo mejor. Ha pasado los últimos 10 años investigando en la biología sintética y en el diseño de la vida, de la materia viva, para forzar esos límites. ¿no? Esas prácticas que van un poquito más allá en esa proposición de los, de los resultados. Y luego está el Vendera, que aparte de ser ya mundialmente conocido y haber creado uno de los iconos de nuestro tiempo en la lucha del cambio climático con esta flag, es eh, un artista conocido por haber generado ese sistema informático que hemos visto cuando hemos entrado y que veremos cuando se hagamos, ¿no? Vale, pues tenemos un poquito más de hablar después de haber escuchado hablar sobre ello, que es el generar simulaciones informáticas utilizando o generando imágenes reales en las que eh, casi parecen imágenes de vídeo o documentales, pero que no lo son. Son programas informáticos que utilizan la tecnología militar y eh, que se cruzan con la industria del, del videojuego para generar una realidad o un mundo paralelo. Y yo creo que estas cuatro, esos cuatro enfoques, ¿no? el trabajo de Francesca como coleccionista, como patrona, como persona, en la que el arte es un medio de, de vida y de expresión, que también lo es para José Luis, a la hora de investigar, comisaría, y eh, en el caso de Daisy y de John, a través de la práctica física, nos van a ayudar a entender cómo la COP y ese deseo de generar una serie de medidas para reducir las emisiones, ¿no? que es el objetivo final a nuestro que tenemos que llegar, que es reducir las emisiones de CO2, 
soy una excusa a un campo de trabajo perfecto para pensar y repensar el, el papel que ocupamos. Y ya no me extiendo más. Van a ser cuatro intervenciones de 15 minutos, no voy a ser especialmente severa, y tengo que dar una cuenta de lo que me pasa en esos 15 minutos. Luego abriremos el debate al público. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much all of you for coming, so numerous on such busy times. And I really want to make a special thank you to the International Law Association that are sitting out there and the top two hours. They have to leave in 20 minutes, but we're going to try and get this out of the way so that they can get the first uh, few words. And um, again, thank you for my co founders for coming. And John, you know, again, this incredible celebration of your wonderful person of life. Which everybody has seen on the way. And we look forward to hearing from you about this. But I thought, sorry about this talk will be in English, um, but I thought I would introduce myself. Because in all the years that I've been holding little fox here, I've never actually been asked to speak. So this is actually the first time that I'm on the panel. <laughs> so, I'm <very> <laughs> so I've earned my, my dues. So um, TBA 21 is a foundation that I created. 2002. Very, very early on in this foundation, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to invest in artists that were engaged in a process of change, trying to make a difference, trying to reflect in their communities, trying to make social political justice, trying to address women's questions, trying to address the environment. And um, I want to tell you that back then, in 2004, 2006, this was totally not cool. It's cool now, but it was not cool then. So I just um, want to remark on the fact that I was heavily criticized for doing this kind of work and investigating this kind of work, although some of these artists are extremely well known. And I want to start with a presentation on an artist called Kudut Asma, because he was the first, actually, artist that I um, commissioned. And I co commissioned this. Okay. So actually, this is interesting because this barge, you can see a big technical barge that's used on the Danube River. This is in front of the Parliament of Budapest, Hungary, which, as we all know, is a very right wing government right now. So, all the more interesting, all these years later, that I brought this work called Kuba, which was commissioned by a Turkish artist called Kuba uh, Basman. And it was actually um, together with the um, Arts Angel Foundation in London. And it was a video of 40 Kurdish minority uh, that lived on the outskirts of Istanbul and who were informed that their little village was being taken over by the big uh, municipality of Istanbul. And they were going to use their right to practice their own language, to practice their own rituals and their own religion and, and teach their children in their Kurdish language. We know the tension between Turkey and Kurdistan at historic levels, especially today. Looking <coughs> back at this piece, these um, videos of all these individual people spoke about their lives, their dreams, what they wanted for their families. Although they were speaking in a foreign language, they were living in headscarves, which in those days one hardly ever saw, even in Turkey. And um, the foreignness of all their appearance in these videos, is overcome by the fact that they share the same dreams in the life they have. They share the same stories and realize that there is an empathy and there's a reaction from sitting there, chair in front of the video. You could just walk around and meet different people, and this was an incredible experience, which today and I'm really looking forward to showing this piece in Madrid because it really tells the story. As it traveled up the entire Danube River from Constantia all the way to Vienna in 2006 and 7, these were the years where Europe was emerging. So in fact, sorry, I'm moving on. Um, but in fact, well, I must have taken all Sorry. Um, we had the seven new entries in the European <coughs> Union, all of them being East European, and I'm coming 
things and can't be put in another way. I'm very sensitive to the fact that you know this opening into the Eastern European bloc was extremely well was to be well received, but also regarded with huge amount of suspicion at the time. So we had different entries from different countries, and this was me giving a talk in Kokova, uh, in, in uh, a city that was completely destroyed during the war in Croatia. Another really important project that we've supported in several uh, documentaries was the work by Amar Kanwa. And this was a project about environmental justice, the sovereign forest, which I showed here in um, two, last year. So those of you who have seen this exhibition, it's also about the Rust Collective and about the right to produce your own rice into India so that it's becoming um, nationalized. And there were many, many testaments and um, different. Uh, the, the, the Orissa government had taken a lot of the property away because there were huge mining concerns in Australia and Korea coming into the area. And this was about um, the removal of these indigenous people. Another project with indigenous people we concentrated on with Ernesto Neto, this extraordinary Brazilian artist. Uh, he brought us up to the, close to the border of Peru, one of the most extraordinary journeys I've ever done. And as you can see, we are sitting there, but what we did is we actually went there to meet 31 shamans and ask them for permission for them to, to represent not only their culture in the exhibition, but to invite them to Europe and whether they would consider that journey. Because it's also a questionable practice to invite um, indigenous people out of their natural habitat. And this was an extraordinary meeting of all of us team of TBA 21 going into their community city and then to the shower discussing their traditions. And they did accept after two days of Agawashka ceremonies. And um, that was quite an extraordinary experience. And you can see me there just at the head of the guitar with a wonderful throne of feathers that was given to me by the chief. It was quite amazing. And this was the ceremony. This is some of the works that they contributed to the exhibition. But this is the exhibition. This letter is something you many of you probably know from, from the art world. But we created our own Kubisha, we had our own ceremonies, and um, these works were interpreted. Over, it was one of the best and longest exhibitions, but it was people coming regularly to see this. Another very important uh, socially political um, exhibition was together with Oliver Eliza. And we did a workshop called Green Light to produce these works. But at the same time, to produce them, we invited all the migrants that were arriving um, in Vienna by the thousands, the first ever, you know, the first big waves of refugees from Iraq, from, from Syria, obviously from, from the Mediterranean, and that were making their way to Germany whilst Andrea, Angela Merkel made that controversial gesture of allowing them in. But the green light for us symbolized you are welcome. And being able to produce these labs gave them additional income to the homes where they were being um, hosted. And as well, there was a whole shared learning process. Whilst they were invited in to live in the German lessons, we were also dealing with about women's questions, which was really giving them a huge amount of trauma. Uh, but the uh, togetherness, and these are a bunch of boys from Afghanistan, so there were many weeks placed in these workshops of women from Somalia and Africa. Um, this is one of the ladies from Somalia who uh, I became extremely familiar. And this project was then moved to the Central Pavilion in the Venice Island. It got a huge amount of visibility. We got three Italian refugees. Mario Garcia Torres is a famous incident in 2003, remember, where, where uh, the, one of the desert storm attacks, the American uh, aimed at a hotel across the river and actually shot two journalists that were standing on the top of the building. They happened to be Spanish journalists. And a famous Spanish judge was no um, So this was a recreation of that history, because that element was never proven that the Americans were never brought to justice for having murdered two Spanish journalists. Um, Los Berlin Charles, this is another commission that we did, which really was, uh, as you can see, 2005. This is that. <coughs> Showing you because we're all these guys are really talking about new stuff. So I thought I'd go a little bit into background. Um, 
Clearly, you know, what I just got into here is interesting in you know, depicting that kind of impact moment when water breaks through your living room. Um, another famous artist that has been in Spain very often in Galicia and in Barcelona, um, Alice Pula, an American legend, who was himself one of the people who really walked into the, the genre and taught many of his students about using journalistic approaches to um, documenting life, real life, real worlds. And this was the practice that was very new at the time, in 2002. This is the Mare uh, Black Tide, Mare Negra, that was, of course, the famous uh, tanker that uh, broke up outside of Galicia and created this huge wave of uh, pollution around this, one of those big super tank disasters. Um, the video is legendary in Spain, it's been shown in many museums in Venice, Sofia, and so on. People know this, this country know this work very well. It sort of brings me over to the oceans because, of course, our friends are um, right in the middle of the sea up there in the top rows. Um, the work that was influenced by a, a series of programming that the TVA Humor Academy initiated a few years ago where we focused um, as a completely independent organization co-founded by TVA21, but it is dedicated to the oceans exclusively and has looked at many, many different problems and issues confronting the oceans. This one in particular, the legendary artist Joe Jonas, who's in the 80s, um, confronts the issue of overfishing and the oceans and also the ocean depths. And this presentation was at the Ocean Space in Venice, a building that was dedicated to the study of oceans through the lens of art. Um, and this project, uh, which is an extraordinary performance as well, we will be presenting this project next February here at the Museum. And there will be a performance of this, we will recreate this performance at the Prada Museum. So we're very, very proud of this. Really, we think this is going to <laughs> And, um, so this is Joan's work, which she sort of layers all these uh, images together in an extraordinary poetic way, and she's a very strong feminist artist. Um, and she brought together so many images of the oceans, and that really became an extraordinary piece that inspired a lot of people. And uh, another commission that is a very recent commission, which will be our second exhibition next year, is by Claudia Conte a Swiss artist, and I love a chip with a chainsaw. It has to be the sexiest thing on this cover. And she produced a group of sculptures, which I'm showing you here, with a chainsaw and a group of young sculptures in Jamaica to residency at the Alligator Head Foundation. And um, she was also introduced to science of the oceans through what was very interesting for her study of corals, because there's actually not a lot of known about corals in this part of the world. So we actually even created one of her earlier sculptures, which is known for creating cactuses in the very bone in the ocean there. Um, we have three of these there, and we're going to plant another three next year. And these cactuses are prone to receiving uh, corals. But unfortunately, the snow area has been confronted by a terrible virus, and all the corals are dying in the beach and like everywhere else. And so we're really feeling rather devastating. Um, so that gives you a slight overview of why, over the years, so many works have been commissioned. And I really only just like to keep it down to very few because I'm not allowed to talk too long because I'm going to always be this at the panel. Um, but um, bringing it all the way up to this moment where um, when the COP25 was invited to come to Madrid um, because of the political strife in, in Santiago de Chile, which is really a very tragic thing as well, and we really hope that the people of Chile, um, uh, their best in their struggle against um, unjust dominance and, and political strife. But, one thing that has to be said is that this COP25 is really supposed to be about the southern oceans, and that is something that is very much the southern hemisphere. There were many, many nations that were very strongly about this opportunity to be in Santiago. So now that things have moved to Madrid, I really hope that this, um, the Pacific Islanders also have their say. 
but um, this very, very important work by John Gerard, who will be here to talk about it, and I'm going to turn on about it, but it was just an extraordinary opportunity to show this here, to be a, to create, a, to, to, to present it as a book on it. How do you summarize, um, as I rushed through my presentation, but how do you actually narrow something down to the ultimate storytelling monument that gives, that speaks for itself, that does not need an explanation, that does not need a uh, lengthy introduction by sophisticated curators. When does an image really speak for itself? I think this is, if there ever was one, um, I don't know, and, um, the image that has really encapsulated this got to the final conference. And I, on this um, moment, there's this last image, and this is uh, Soledad's four-year-old son standing in front of this image, and I think that's the image that really speaks for this conference. Thank you so much. And I wanted to go by the way. I do want to congratulate the museum, uh, Francesca and Peter Duan, for being one of the cultural institutions of the city that, in spite of having less than a month, wanted to do something uh, to remind and see this is what was happening. And Send us to you know, culture and the arts that were also part of this huge event. Uh, the, the cops usually have big ambitious cultural programs. Of course, it has not been possible this time because of the little more than a month that it was preparing, but I really want to congratulate the huge effort I know the museum and the community one have wanted to make those projects and, and this event to make happen. So, yeah, this is what's happening uh, at this weekend. By the way, one big uh, caveat that I have to say, and I just realized, like usually two minutes ago, about this. Uh, I know there will be some cop delegates in the audience, so I'm not a private scientist. I'm going to try to be as rigorous as I can in terms of trying to explain. I mean, that was even the very difficult task of explain what is going on, explaining what historical political context it happens. So if I'm not 100% precise or rigorous at some point, please don't be afraid of correcting me or later in the, in the Q&A section intervening. But I don't do my best. So, yeah, I think it's good to remember, as Francesca has said, that we are here, but we shouldn't be here, because we should be in Santiago de Chile, where at least uh, something should be happening. And we're going to happen because of course of political turmoil, that happened, uh, that was being started by our ladies in the tariffs in public transportation. And uh, it's not really even an exception, no, because the same way that it's happening in Santiago, it's been happening in Hong Kong. So 2019, we're gonna one more year in terms of the wave of global terminal that is across the world. In the case of, uh, of uh, uh, Chile, it started because of our ladies in in public transportation the same way that in... Yeah. Okay, better. Sorry. You did not speak very much. Uh, the same way that in France, it was to start another cycle of protest because of a raise in the, in the price of gas. Uh, what I didn't know, I think I was preparing this call, and probably many of you already know, is that this COP25 shouldn't even have happened in uh, Chile. It was going to happen in Brazil. It was a country that originally got and received uh, the, uh, the commission of preparing this call. And in late 2018, just two months after Bolsonaro uh, won the elections, Brazil renounced uh, to host the COP25. They said because of the change of administration and because of administrative and uh, money problems, it is also why they renounced. Because of course, the message of Bolsonaro and the message of what the COP stands for is good line. Uh, this is France a uh, few weeks ago. As you many of you may remember, the because of yellow best protest was being started by this raise in the price of gas, some of the first uh, uh, claims, some of the first sentences that were used in protest was uh, I'm not worried about being on the wall, I'm worried about being on the month, which was kind of like in a way creating this extrapolation between the politics of the day to day and the politics of the law or at least of the politics of the last 80 years that the Paris Agreement and the COP is standing for. 
Later, this has been re-inscribed and re-described in this other sentence, the end of the world and the end of the world are the same fight, are the same conflict. Uh, well, I was just starting to say this because, of course, the geopolitical state of the world in 2019 cannot be decoupled from the extent to which this paradigm crisis that was a start being foreseen 25 years ago in the first conference on the parties in Rio is already starting to percolate through the system of the world. We know that the state of environmental distress is already one major factor of the strategy. I would also highlight two other things that are happening in Madrid right now, and I think it's important to highlight. The other is that the COP is not the only big uh, gathering of people involved and demanding uh, climate justice. Uh, the social, the uh, UNSCA which is the social uh, summit for the climate, is a big gathering of organizations, ONG, activist groups that consider that they don't feel represented by one of the COP stands. They're asking for more radical and more involved engagement in the political uh, movement that basically is requesting for a radical transformation of everything. And uh, of course, a lot of people will be going into the FEM and will be in the FEM in these days, but where you can see that a lot of people are going Saturday taking over the streets <coughs> in a big massive demonstration uh, where Greta uh, uh not only joined, but, but, but in a way, held in front of uh, I wanna also highlight, I think it's very important that 2019, this year that is about to finish, has been an absolutely historical year in terms of, uh, for the climate justice movement. Uh, in a way, we have crossed a threshold in the perception, the global social perception of what it needs to happen, of what the level of direct political action and purpose action that is required to make this uh, problem the political priority that we have. So, if we have to ask where do we stand or where does this COP25 stand, it takes place four years of probably the most important, of course, the most significant uh, COP or climate summit in recent memory, which was called Paris in 2015, the place where the Paris Agreement uh, was uh, first uh, proclaimed and then ratified by uh, almost all the nations in the world. Uh, we are 40 years away from Paris, and we're in a moment of transition, because next year will also be a very important year. Uh, this is very embarrassing to me, so please forgive me for those people who know better. But for those of you who don't know sort of what is the, the goal that the Paris Agreement proclamates, it basically says the biggest statement is that at some point to be determined of the second part of the 21st century, that's at some moment between 2050 and 2100, our CO2 emissions to the atmosphere will have to be zero. And all the coal, all the gas, all the oil that is still left will have to be kept in the ground forever. There is some, this is so that we reach this uh, goal of trying to achieve that global temperatures don't raise more than two degrees, ideally more than 1.5 degrees over the industrial levels. Or there, there is another part of the, of the, of the Paris Agreement that says that in order to achieve that goal, it will not only be necessary to stop raising CO2 to the atmosphere in the second part of the 21st century, but we also need to do more. We will need also to uh, develop technologies that allow us to extract some of the CO2 that is currently in the atmosphere. Uh, right now, the only technology we, we have to do that effectively is plastic trees. Uh, and of course, there are all kinds of schemes trying to develop carbon capture and sequestration systems, but that is what we want. Uh, of course, after Paris and after the world map to Paris was established, which basically said that countries would set their own uh, limits to emissions and their own uh, calendar. So, for instance, we as citizens of the European Union have committed to, in 2030, having reduced our CO2 emissions 40% over our levels of 1990. And then for every country, it's different. Of course, the first big blow, uh, this is a picture of the other day at the COP summit. Uh, uh, was the U.S. Uh, after Donald Trump's uh, electoral victory declaring that it was not going to stay in Paris and it was actually going to ratify the, the, the agreement. This is all the organizations that were represented by Climate Alliance, the, the U.S. family union at the COP, which don't represent the, the U.S. government, that represent cities, state, and all kinds 
complex organizations in order to want to establish their community. Uh, Filosofer Bruno Latour has a sentence that I really like, which is he says that when Donald Trump left the Paris Agreement, in a way what he was saying is that the citizens of the US were the only people sharing the same planet than the rest of the planet. Right? And Bruno Latour he said that, that, that the US putting out Paris meant a statement that says that we don't live in the same planet. So we don't, in a way, need to share the same set of concerns. Or, in a sentence, apparently uttered by, by, by George Bush, my father, uh, in the first, or one of the first seven summits, our way of living is non negotiable. Uh, this is actually, of course, in political uh, terms, a very strong declaration because at the same time, it seems that the biophysical limits of the planet are non negotiable either. So, the conflict between one statement or another really now represents a lot of political. Next year, it's a very important year in this fight, 2020, for a couple of reasons. One is that the Paris Agreement enters into effect really in that year. This for me, when countries need to start applying the commitments of CO2 reduction that they adopted in Paris. Also, because it will be five years after Paris and they will be able to revisit them with the, these commitments can be revisited every five years. But also, and again, please go ahead and just put your own on shore, or this is way more, this needs to be precise. But also, it's a very important year because for a lot of people in this fight, among the Christian affiliates, which was the leading figure in the negotiation of the Paris Agreement, for order to be able to reach, and we still want to have any chance of reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement, which is not going over uh, to the increase in average temperature at 1.5, and this one point five is important. Next year, 2020, has to be, has to be the absolute top year in number of total CO2 emissions. It's the last year is the last ever year in which we can emit more CO2 than the previous year. If we want to have, next year, sorry, if we want to have any kind of uh, hope to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. So we are already at this point. We're saying that time is critical at the moment. It is as critical as in 12 years from now, 12 months from now, we will know if we have really still more CO2 than this, than, than this year, but less than in 2021. I'm sorry, that was a bit dodgy, but this is where I'm uh, On Saturday, we were incredibly lucky because we could be speaking there uh, in a panel organized by the Institute of Empresa at the University of Madrid and TV21. Uh, and it was important for, for me and Francesca and Marcus, the director of TV21 Academy, because I think it was probably Maybe one of the first times we were talking about the role of arts and the culture within the blue zone of, of, of the COP, which is where the governments are, and where, of course, more conversations is being around economy, about politics, about science, and not necessarily about culture. Uh, one of the points that I guess that we made today by being there is that if we're going to, if we have any kind of hope of moving uh, ahead and actually uh, finding a way out of this crisis, we're of course going to need scientific research, we're going to need technological innovation, we're going to need political will, but we're also going to need social innovation, learning and thinking about other ways of thinking, and cultural innovation, thinking of other ways of staying and being in the world. Uh, and this is what we think that artists and the arts community have a role to play in this uh, 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 fight. Uh, that is not a role, as Francesca said, I think is very important, the quality of use, but the it's not about making things nice or more comprehensible, but it's about, as another research community, joining and collaborating with other communities of researchers in finding new paths ahead. And of course, I have a lot of the slide that I'm not going to be able to show because we only have 15 minutes. I am, in any way, extremely excited of having with us today two artists and two practitioners that I think exemplify and represent this kind of involvement and this kind of uh, uh, active uh, position from the arts community and the cultural community uh, in this person of the Paris Agreement. Yes. One small detail that I because I'm so passionate about the ocean is that also the COP21 was the very first COP where oceans actually had a mandate uh, and the study of the oceans as a uh, climate mitigating mitigator was brought forward. And this COP, again, 
the oceans have fed the Indian for two days, which was just for today. And we have with us one of the leading uh, people in this position, the Honorary Commandant, who's really been leading um, this charge and bringing the oceans into the COP dialogue. And so the climate change dialogue, and this is something that is written and which has been so important that perhaps President Nelson and his wants to say in the struggle for climate change. Uh, I would like to say a few words about John Macy, uh, whose work I have admired for a very long time. Uh, John Gerard is uh, uh, an artist that I think encapsulates or represents a lot of the ways in which we are talking about the state of the world today, which is through systems, models, and simulations. <coughs> systems, models, and simulations are scientific tools, but they're also tools of interpretation of reality. And I think in his work, he has built through his practice a really incredible collection of examples of how infrastructures of power, systems of operation can be presented as uh, active agents that can impact in the world. He, of course, has done the absolutely incredible things that you can see upstairs, but through his years, he has done a really interesting practice through these decades. So we are incredibly happy to have him here today. And Daisy Ginsburg, who I have also admired because She's been to me one of the examples of how an honest researcher will sit down at the same table, all the researchers in her case. She was one of the few people working in synthetic biology, one incredibly important field in which we are literally designing and starting to write living organisms to engage with that community to think about the role that critical designers and artists will have in phrasing the questions that a new technology and that a new space of scientific inquiry can pull because a new space of science and a new technology is also a new form of shaping society. And scientists and activists cannot be alone in that endeavor of making the questions that will shape society. This has also been uh, very much in the last few years focused on the question of extinction, of the biodiversity crisis, which is the other incredibly important crisis along with the climate crisis today. Uh, I am so happy to have both of you here. So thanks for joining us today. And that's all for me. Thanks for coming, Jodie Ryan. Okay, so it is absolutely great to be here. This might be one of the most important places on Earth right now. Not this room, but Madrid, uh, because you guys have work to do, and we are, uh, you know, we need change. So. Uh, it's just wonderful to be here. And I thank this Moritza, the museum, Day 21, for this extraordinary uh, act of uh, ingenuity, bravery, uh, punk uh, sort of animation, bringing Western flag as an LED wall that would normally take a year to plan in a week to move it. And I will eventually recover from that week. So, it is good to be here. Now, I was very strict about timing, so could you give me a pen editor? Do you mind? Just... So, this is the reason I made Western Flag. This is an image uh, of the very first oil strike, the big, the first big oil strike <laughs> in world history, which happened in 1901 in Spindletop, in Texas. And a wild camera called Lucas. Uh, adjusted a water drill, and it became a um, new technology to penetrate the earth, and there was this extraordinary rumbling sound, and up flew an incredible jet of petrol. This is a little man down here, and this is considered the birth of big oil. Now, when I learned history in school, I learned history of conflict. I did not learn history of materials. There's a missing history of materials in society. Oil leapt from the earth in 1901. This one strike produced more oil a day than every other oil strike in America combined on that day. All the shallow wells on the East Coast. This one well dwarfed them all. 100,000 barrels a day. Took them nine days to cap it. And the oil pooled in the Gulf of Mexico which is right beside this site. So, why is this site important to me? Let's go to the next slide, please. Because this is 1902. 
the birth of modernity as far as I'm concerned, because America was the first petro state. By the 1950s, it had transformed this material into global hegemony in military concerns, agricultural, financial, transport, you name it. Oil transformed America, and America subsequently shipped this system out worldwide. We still live in an American world. The cities we make look just like this because we live in an oil world. And one more person talks about green cities. I will have an air raid incident because there are no green cities. And I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. Next slide. So, I'm going to start it. Western, Western Flag was commissioned to television. Uh, by an amazing guy called John Hay, who is a television commissioner. And he came to me and he said, will you cut into Channel 4 in the UK, and will you intervene in the space of television? And I said, well, I never watch television, but I give it a shot. And, um, and I sent him something, and he said, this is really bad, he said. Like, it's just so sophisticated. My audience of 10 million people will never understand this. So I was like, really? Commissioners? Trying to work back like that? I used to think it would be a bit you know, more polite to artists. But, um, and then I sent another day, he was like, John, you're going to have to do much, much better. And I'm like, what? So, and then finally I sent him a thing. Just go back inside, actually, sorry. I'm just going to um, And one more. I um, have been thinking about this strike for 10 years. And what I was thinking, is what it left behind is invisible. It is called carbon dioxide. But what is carbon dioxide? It is invisible. It has no political image. So this strike produced uh, uh, like so much carbon dioxide. A lot of it is still in the atmosphere. And you know, most people, not this audience, because you guys are all super sophisticated, but most people don't know that the oil burnt in 1901, a portion of it still in the atmosphere, is this invisible gas called carbon dioxide. So I wanted to give it an image. I mean, it almost looks like a flag already. It's like this banner in the air. So I said, why don't we try and give carbon dioxide an image? Why don't we make it visible? And then I thought, well, as carbon dioxide is now threatening the nation state, why don't we have a flag disintegrated? So anyway, go two steps forward. So you can start. This is the TV intervention, Danny Sam. So this is some of these, um, this is some of these, uh, like this is a home decorating show. And I said, don't put anything before the work. So she's all excited because her home's getting decorated and suddenly, cut it. And I said, don't frame it. It's a hard cut. I don't want anything to announce this thing. 20 seconds, Granny drops her key, it's a freak out. But Ofcom insisted on hashtag it, so we never put on that. But I didn't put my name to this because this has nothing to do with my identity. This is a intervention in public space. Next slide, please. <coughs> so we cut into TV for 24 hours, and this was a work commissioned for television. That's what it was. So that's why it's cutting into all these other spaces. Like none of my other works are cutting into other spaces. Because it's kind of recognizable. The TV commissioner like forced me to make it. So I, I have to say that like John Hay is half responsible for these things. Anyway, so I should finish up fairly soon, but it was one day on television, it was one week on an LED wall in the Somerset House, and I oh, oh yeah, so, so I worked on LED walls because we have we have a ridiculous problem right now, which pe people think technology is different. And it's not. We are here. We have a presence and identity here. Technology is an extension. We don't have two identities. We have one identity. We live here and in the virtual. And we must not think we have two identities. We have a digital identity completely dominated by American corporates at the moment, which is destructing democracy. You have to hold on to something. So I wanted the real. And I know a lot about the virtual. I know a lot about modeling. I know a lot about simulation. They rub up right against each other, and they are the same. The digital landscape is the same as the physical landscape. We exist in all of them, and they belong to us. They don't belong to American corporates. 
And that's something we have to undo, which is another subject. Go to the next slide, or is that the last slide? Anyway, so, and Francesca, who is an animator and is fearless, bought this work. By the way, the work is free for those who cannot afford it and very expensive for those who can. So Francesca very generously acquired it for her collection, but we also produced a live stream, uh, which we'll get to next, because we can go to the live stream. So for Francesca, incredibly generously, along with the museum, along with the Ikea one, brought this work to reviewing and said it has to be at the center of this discussion about the nation. And that's why it's here. And I'm so proud that it's here, and I'm so thankful it's here. And I'm here to support it. I mean, I'm an artist. I'm only an artist. My work can only move the public. Everything else is politics. But nobody has a clue what this is, so I have to turn up and explain it. And I don't mind doing that, but then I'm going to piss off back to my studio and have some you know, work in the lives. But just go to the next slide and I'll finish. The last thing. So I wanted to try and make carbon dioxide a political image because it's invisible, first of all. Secondly, I wanted to acknowledge that climate change denial, which America is very involved in, is a form of extreme violence towards the most vulnerable members of society. When you deny climate change, you pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and you heat up the world and then you build a wall and you lock the door so people who are affected by this heating cannot move around. We have to put our foot down and say that climate change denial is a form of extreme violence towards the most vulnerable people on the earth. And I say to you that America is still in hegemonic control of this place. It has 38 places all over the world. It's in control and it's not leading. So we have to turn our back on this disintegrated country that is questioning the very nature of the nation itself. This is an American flag. It is disintegrated. It's not leading. It's not going to lead here at COP25. I don't know what China's going to do, but Europe has to come together and do something now about carbon dioxide. And that is my only, only, only request, is to do something now. There is no political vision now. We have to find a vision and make some simple requests of the European Union. They have to lead on climate change. That's my only request. That's why I made that piece. This one puts me here in action and to contribute to this conversation and I want to offer a different publication um, and that is to this question of what is this better world that we're trying to make? I spend a lot of time with scientists and engineers and technologists and industrialists and designers and all who promise that they can make a better world. And I began to wonder well, what is better? And what does it mean to you? Does it mean greener, more profitable, more equitable? All of these different things at once. Is this better? The PET plastic bottle was invented in the 1970s to help carbonated drinks. It was lighter and stronger and used less materials and less carbon to transport than the glass bottles that you get. It was better. But of course, it's also much worse. We finally realize that the violence has been an amazing economic good, it's an environmental risk. And the plastic bottle is just an everyday example of how we use design and technology to solve particular problems and in the process create entirely new and unexpected and much bigger ones. These three items are going to be greener than the things that they were next. Once I noticed this problem of better, the paradox of better, I began to see it everywhere. Better is used to sell us everything from petrol to water to rising political ideologies. But better isn't the same as good. Better for some will be worse for others. Better depends on agendas, on people, on contexts. And I became so curious about how a word which has so much power in our contemporary world, that we invest so much in, how it has no shared meaning. And I became so curious, I wrote my PhD about this problem, 
And I realized that every time we hear this promise, we need to be asking, what is better? Whose better is being delivered? And who gets to decide? These are purposely really simple questions, but they become really useful when we start to apply them to questions like this, which is ultimately what we're arguing about here in Madrid, is well, how do we make nature better? What does that even mean? Are we making nature better for ourselves, so it's more useful to us? Are we trying to emancipate ourselves even further from the natural world? Or are we really trying to better a damaged nature to fix problems that we have made? And when I say we, I mean some of us, not all of us. And that's also part of the problem. Because better is a human idea. And as such, it has human measures that are defined by human values. <coughs> it just doesn't apply in the same way to the natural world. In nature, better means survival across species, not individuals. We could say in, in this climate emergency that we can take an anthropogenic view to this and say, well, what's better for nature is better for us because it'll mean our own survival. But who gets excluded from this? And I think ultimately the problem is that there are many betters and many different ways to define this. I flew here to talk about an environmental crisis and feeling guilty that it conflicts within my own personal kind of matrix of betters. The problem is, is that we really need to find ways to kind of get new perspectives on this, not just for what a better world looks like, but who, which humans is it better for, and also to bring in a non-human perspective. This is a very abstract sort of framing, and I'd love to show you four works that I've made in the last year that answer and start to approach some of these questions and open up new perspectives on what is better. What's really important to me in my work is I collaborate with scientists and technologists and people with very different views on what these technologies do is a way of bringing the non-human perspective to the foreground in the work and actually creating new perspectives where we can look back on our own relationship with nature. So I'd like to start with this project, Resurrecting the Sublime, <coughs> where I've worked with scientists and the smell artists to bring back the smell of extinct flowers. These flowers were all lost to colonial action. And the first flower is the Gibiscodelphus wilderianus, and it grew on the southern slopes of Mount Haleakala on the island of Maui in Hawaii. And its habitat was destroyed by colonial cattle ranching, and the last tree was seen dying in 1912. The Orbexinus stipulatum grew on a small rocky island near the Ohio River. The flower was last seen in 1881, and efforts to cultivate it didn't work. The island itself was erased in the 1920s when US Dam No. 41 was built and totally erased the island itself. And the third flower is the Lucidendron Grandosaurus, a protea that grew on the granite soils behind Table Mountain in Cape Town. And this flower was last seen in London in a collective garden in 1805 because its habitat had already been destroyed. Um, sorry, it had already been destroyed um, by colonial vineyards. So all that's left of these flowers are herbarium specimens. And in 2016, Christina Agapakis, who's a synthetic biologist, went to the Harvard University herbarium and took samples of these three extinct flowers. And from those samples, the scientists that gave her bioworks, the company that she works with, she's created director of, were able to extract DNA, and from that DNA, analyze and predict and reproduce the smell molecules that these, these flowers would have made. They produced lists of molecules that were then sent off to Berlin to the smell researcher and artist Cecil Tolas, who reconstructed the smell of each flower in her lab. And then it was up to me to try and build installations where people could once again experience these lost flowers. So this is in saint Etienne in France earlier this year. The left hand vitrine contains the smell of the hibiscus and the right hand vitrine contains the smell of the orbexinum. And each vitrine connects the lost landscape with the lost flower because the flower couldn't exist without its habitat. So these are lava boulders inside the vitrine. And as people enter, they become part of the diorama, the human 
becomes the subject, unlike the Natural History Museum, where you're looking at the stuffed animals instead. So this was great fun for me to actually get everyone inside the exhibit. And what's really crucial here is you have people kind of experiencing this contingency of nature. These are obscure flowers that lived in obscure parts of the world and suddenly we have focused on experiencing this loss. These three flowers are lost. This is not a de-extinction project, we can't bring them back. But what we've made here is a way to also bring attention to things, that there's moments in the history of biology. And the question is if you actually can give this experience to people, this moment where you can once again kind of get a glimpse of a past, get a full picture. This is not a perfect reconstruction of the smell, just like these are perfect reconstructions of the flowers that we made in the studio. Is there a way to reconnect people with other places and so that we behave better, that we treat other places better, other species better, and other humans better? This notion of loss has carried through quite a lot of my projects this year, and I think it's the news, <laughs> it's making it happen. Um, and this project, The Substitute, began when Twitter advertised to me the loss of Sudan, the last male of North of my last March. I didn't even know who was the last male, and suddenly I cared. And what was so fascinating in the news coverage was that everyone was writing, well, it's okay because scientists are planning on taking the last two females and harvesting their eggs, and then we're going to create new northern white rhinos through artificial insemination, and they will be implanted in southern white rhinos, and we'll have the species back, so don't worry. And I was so curious, well, what is the status of this technologically resurrected rhino? Is it work possible? Is it, uh, you know, why would we look after that one more than the ones that we've already failed to look after? And I began talking to a rhino expert, um, Dr. Pollock, who filmed the last eight northern white rhinos when they were in the zoo in the Czech Republic in the early 2000s. And this included Sudan and the last two females before they were sent to Kenya. And he told me that this, the northern white was the most social of all the subspecies. So if you have a northern white rhino born technologically to southern white, a southern white female as its surrogate mother, how will it learn to be a northern white rhino? An animal isn't just its DNA, it's also a social and cultural being. And at the same time, we're investing billions in artificial intelligence, and this is work by DeepMind, the AI company, who are training an artificial agent, a piece of AI, to navigate a way around its way around the box. And what they were so excited about, and I was excited when I read this research, was that their artificial agent solved the problem of navigation in a similar way to the, the mammalian brain has solved this problem. So you have this artificial reproduction of a life form. But why do we care more about new life forms when we fail to protect those that already exist? What is the status of these things? This kind of question is not a new concern. And I was reminded of the Jura rhinoceros in 1515. Jura never saw this rhino. It was sent from India to the king of Portugal. He thought it was so great, he sent it on to Pope, and it died in a shipwreck on the way. And Jura drew it from this report that he heard, and it has an extra horn on its back. And that error in reproduction was copied over and over again through the Enlightenment. The symbol of knowledge and the unknown had errors in reproduction. So I became so con sort of concerned about this idea of the archival copy and the errors in reproduction of these new rhinos, I decided to make my own. And this is the substitute. I'll show a short clip now. It's based on the video footage. Is that sound? Should be very loud. So we used footage from um, Dr. Pollock's 23 hours of tapes that were sent to us in a cognac box in the Czech Republic, and the experiment from Deep Minds, the basis of this behavior.
So he reconstitutes over and over again in the gallery, just with a sense of the scale he's about, he's life size, so three and a half meters wide when he comes back to the glass. You can currently see him in a Royal Academy in London. The question is, is this better? Is this technologically resurrected running over rhino that we deserve? Or is this is this actually a better way, a, a, a kinder of way of treating something that we care about? So the rhino doesn't care if it exists or not, it's something that we care about. And what is our duty to this copy? I'm asking lots of questions, I hope you can discuss these. I don't know which one it's to. So I want to kind of challenge because a lot of what I deal with are these techno utopian dreams that we can solve all the problems we've created. And one of those biggest problems um, I see is this idea that we have a backup plan on Mars. And there's some very powerful people who are saying, well, we'll trash this planet and we'll go to Mars. And the reason to do that is because Earth is going the way of Mars. We just flip this image, this is what we're doing to this planet. And we can save ourselves. This raises all sorts of questions about colonization and uh, it not being better for many people and many species, but it also raises a couple of really important questions, namely, why is Mars really better than humans? And why are we going to be better when we're on Mars? Why are we going to treat this planet any differently? And to, to counter this colonial narrative, I wanted to come up with a completely different proposition. And I'm sending, in the simulation, 16 extremophiles files from Earth to Mars in stages to build a wilderness, and humans will never go there. So this project runs over a million years. Uh, this is the year 30,000 of the South Pole on Mars. It takes an hour in the gallery, and nothing very much happens. So if we look in detail what's happening here, there's um, some lichen that's just emerging, growing somewhere in here. Half a million years later, we've got some global warming happening. And if you look in detail, there's some plants starting to grow. It's an evolution of the ocean. 800,000 years in, we have a meadow. What's missing, of course, is the human element. We can only look for these surveillance footage. footage. And what's really important is that in the gallery, this is always showing two parallel simulations running at the same time. There's different ways that the world could go, and the human influence is only one way on this world. Uh, <laughs> you showed this a few weeks ago at Cafeteria, you asked if we could speed it up. <laughs> it's slow to build an ecosystem. Uh, so this is it in exhibition. And again, when you start to evaluate the two side by side, you have to ask, well, which is better? And it starts to reveal our own prejudices as we look at the natural world around us. I'm going to finish very quickly by giving it just a taste of this project, Machine Auguries, which we completed last month in the studio. There was a commission for an exhibition at Sunset House, which is about the effects of our 24 7 lifestyle um, on ourselves. And I wanted to think about other species, namely bird populations, <coughs> and how we are kind of affecting silently other species. So, birds are singing longer and higher and earlier and for. Um, so only the birds that can adapt to their song will actually survive. They can't find each other to communicate in the drawn chorus because of the noise and light pollution in the urban environment. Yeah. And some of us can sense. So just to give a taste of what we did, um, a natural robin, just to remind us. And the robin made by a machine learn to sing that along. Day one, day seven, that's the machine singing back. And the final piece brings together an artificial dawn chorus to create a very different kind of experience of the natural world, one where we're having to fit in the spectrum of what is missing. Just by saying, oh, it sounds like the machine's taking over. Let me do next time. As we imagine other natures, 
other better natures and better worlds? How do we create different perspectives and actually prioritise the non-human? And I would always ask that we ask these questions as we kind of try to define the parameters that we're trying to create. Thank you. And from Trump to Bolsonaro, uh, there's been a reaction to the basic uh, principle of rights of women saying that we are headed to a future with no government, with no civil permission, because it's our only option. Uh, some people have called that push back carbonism, which is sort of like the fundamentalism of the idea that carbon and that racism to one another feel is almost God given, right? It's a personal thing. Uh, I don't know what, how do you feel, how much of this is an economic point of problem or how much is an ideological problem? Um, that's an interesting term, carbonism. Uh, I haven't heard that one before, but I have developed uh, some of my own phrase which is called the carbon right. Because every time I think about bad actors, um, they are funded by extractive industries. Every single one. When I think about Trump, he is really supported by the carbon right of Bolsonaro. When I look at the behaviors of entities like Russia, extractive industries are very, very dominant there, and they are really supporting uh, so I think it is interesting to consider those who do not want to see any change because of the preventing the pink materials from under the earth and making lots of money. And they are the carbon right. And uh, we just have to say no. No to the carbon right. And I think we can only say that in Europe. As as I'm because we have to go to America, we have to go to China, just have to say no here now. That's my view. But I would, carbonism seems a little kind of like kind of uh, complicated for me. I think the carbon right is sort of to me a good thing. But I, I think a lot of people are criticizing China at the moment, but I may be wrong. But my understanding is that China is actually one of the biggest players in the rest of their. Um, and looking at new technologies and new energies. So I'm, I'm, I don't think one should throw them under the mask of the Americans. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> all, all I'm saying is if you have some really big power blocks, America is obviously very dominant and not leading. China's basically doing its own thing, really. I mean, it's not leading on climate change, it's concentrating on addressing it within China. That's my instinct. I mean, I've been in the yet, but I've seen the facilities. We put out, rolled out, you know, we uh, so incredible social facilities in the globe there. Incredible. But, I mean, we do live in a real geopolitical world with power blocks. And I just feel Europe has been really exposed to bad actors. And, uh, you know, Facebook would be obviously responsible for Cambridge Analytica. We have got to deal with that. I mean, Facebook should really just be from the Abbey Road as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, outside of that, um, I think China has a lot to offer. It's certainly tweaking American scale in the Pacific. You know, there was recently, you know, serious pivot in the Pacific from Washington to Beijing. That's real. That's happening. If you remember what happened in the Second World War, a lot of blood was spilled. The dominant Pacific, like America. So, you know, I don't know, there's change happening in the video way, there's nothing like that. We'll see. But without a doubt, everything that I find in the world that's bad is supported by the carbon right. And we just have to turn on them and tell them to leave us alone. It is an ideology. It's an ideology of gross profit. And if I see one more rich list, the fourth richest in the world is grotesque. Should we replace that with ethical? Yes. That's what the kids of my family want. <laughs> the richest one hundred in the world is a race to the bottom. And it influences all those men, mostly some women, to just accumulate wealth for no good reason. And a lot of that is very destructive to the environment. Nobody needs that money. It's a race to the bottom, driven by entities like Ford, 
let's go forward to publish about ethical bits, throw away to the top 100 reaches. They are terrorists on Earth. Yeah. It has to do with one considering very much as a thing of understanding that we need a new deal with nature in the sense of how we are going to our relationship with non humans. Uh, and to me, in a way, it seems kind of like one area of improvement uh, is the idea of reparation. And reparation, of course, as a term, has a specific background in historical reparations to post colonialism in the colonialism uh, contexts. Uh, the discourse of reparation has to do with a specific set of ideas about how recognizing the damage status of the world is a journey towards trying to undo some of our wrongs by a new set of ideas and it's hard for me to kind of like find the ideological uh, uh, contours of the idea of operation. It includes very humble things to very utopian things like the idea of the extinction. So I don't know how you relate your work and your framework with this term and how you feel about it. I think um, it's a very complex question. The Extinct Flower Project directly relates to that. How do we what is our role as two our physical scientists and a corporation resurrecting the smell of its big flowers but all their activities and global activity? Whose flowers are they to bring back? They're not covered by the number one protocol because the samples were taken in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They are um they belong to people whose lands that were taken by colonial um, intruders. Do they what is the correct conversation? That's something that I want to do through the project. And we started trying to open up those conversations. Um, you know, and the, the Mars project, in a way, is the kind of ultimate switch around, I guess. You know, it was commissioned for a show about moving to Mars in London. And I just don't want to move to Mars. I don't think we have any right to move to Mars. Yes, we should go and explore it if we really want to. It might be interesting. But um, what right do we have to? Eliminate the prospect of living inside another planet having its own right to exist. And so the, all the colonial sort of language around Mars seems to be completely forgotten because the impact of that language when we are talking about a different planet, so Elon Musk can talk about you know, us all growing there. What are the reparations that we will have to pay? I don't really know the answer to your question, but I think it's um, you know, these kinds of what I'm doing is quite abstract in a way, they're not directly engaging with the groups and peoples who um, are the most connected to this. And in a way, I'm dealing with using the most extremely advanced technologies like machine learning to open up questions, but it's, it's a kind of activist act. I can slip into exhibitions about technology and make people think about wonders, or I can slip into exhibitions about artificial intelligence and be talking about flowers. And how do we get people in power to actually? change their perspective and look at these things as not just decoration but entities for their own rights and I think that's the starting point for thinking about how we address this in new ways not just peoples who deserve reparations but also the landscapes and other organisms. Um, so this is the impact of the climate change. I have to come all the way from Tom to here to let you know the crisis of this, it's absolutely devastating. The sea is rising, the acidification is happening. So, with all of this, it's, I was one of those 5,000 people who were walking in the church. I'm not too sure if it's having agency. I'm much more looking for a solution, not an artificial intelligence solution. Simply, I'm, 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 I'm frankly, I'm with you, Doctor, for what you do it, pressing the message. But for the ground level of all of this, the children of the ocean have no representation, fairly and proportionally, on this side of the world. If you were at the outdoor message today, I will not repeat what he was saying, but pretty much what he was saying is a criminal act. I was with John Kerry today when he was saying at the same time. We are in the fragment 
I'm not too sure what you're saying about better. For me, getting better is what Francis was doing for me. See, why did you come here? It's about you, left to your right, sharing what you have. For me, it's been better. It's about saying hello to the person next to you. That's the Pacific Ocean. I've been involved with everything in the, in the, in the planet since I was a primate. I'm really appreciative of what uh, it's about the crop, it's about the ocean. I'm not too sure you understand very much. The ocean is on fire. And I can give you my personal opinion because I'm an international artist myself. And my opinion is very simple. We are, as human beings, we won't be exist if we are going to come together. The earth will carry on, not earth. And that's the devastation impact of this. I'm here to fight because I have all of us here, here the children, twin children. Seeing Craig at Brother yesterday, her message was so simple. I was with them yesterday. So my, um, my, uh, with you, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. That's all I can say. Thank you. Can I ask one question in return? Um, sure. From where you are from, where you stand, Amongst us, from, from, from where you are, I'm from the kingdom of do you have one action that you seek here this week? Is there one thing? <laughs> very simple, very simple. My, 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 um, my message is very simple. It's about inclusiveness. We cannot, we all have equity, we all need one another. The people that you fight against, <laughs> Is the people who put us together. And my message is very simple. It's about being able to have a human level of kindness and love. Feeling that we are devastated. If you're going to come to Tonga, I'm not too sure if you understand this in a cycle of another five, between five or six, I want you to bring your children to Tonga. See what they like for you. Yeah. They're going to face the real impact of what you. But re remember what I said. I said that carbon ch climate change denial is a form of extreme violence towards the most vulnerable people on the earth. That's what I said. Yeah, I'm with you. And I'm so, what do we say to those who are denying climate change? Who is the American administration? What do we say to them? I just said, why don't they have to come to Tonga? Bring their children to Tonga. Which, which one? The denial you say. Yeah, but like people here from America are part of COP, they're not denial. It's the people in control that are in denial. That's you, your message for them to go and do that. Because you are an American. So your message you can be able to go and not tell them is my message. No, I I'm not, sorry, I am Irish. I am Irish. European. Okay. I am not American. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's a good start. I, I am a European and I ask Europe to lead on this. Really? I ask Europe to actually do something this week. And my simple request, I have one for this week. Really? Which is create, I mean, this, we're going over the top of the freedom line. You're going to do that thing, no? Um, I ask Europe to do one thing. It's called social.eu. It is a publicly owned, European-wide social network where we can speak to each other in democracy, a part in technology where we can talk to each other in democracy, then Europe can get something done. At the moment, we have a digital identity which is controlled by an American company, and that is destroying European democracy. We in Europe can lead and we can help you to try and stop boiling our peripheries. Remember that boiling is going to come to the center. It will come here. It's not here yet. We have to regain political power by getting control over our digital identities. That is abstract, but it is what we need this week. I ask for that. I'm totally with you. And I'll give you my question.
it's the Lord. You want to take control of itself and its vision. It can help you. America will not help you. Maybe the next administration, it will not help you now. It is hurting you. Europe can help. It takes control of its democracy. It has taken control of its digital landscapes. And then we can do something together. Remember, Facebook did Brexit. Facebook did Trump. Facebook leave. We need an option that is public to vote. And then we can help. I'm with all of you, sir. All of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, question. Yes, this question is to you. Um, you know, you mentioned the experience of having a ceremony that basically is uh, a little bit contrary to the standard uh, European paradigm. They are very, very like, act, it just expands you in a new way of understanding. And I think there is a very powerful message uh, from the original people, the, I mean, native people and elders who are here in COP and they've been like, really pushing forward. The need to be listened to them, you know? So as European and as an artist, and what's your you know, experience you can share on that in terms of how embracing this tradition or exposing yourself to, to a ceremony such um, can enrich the paradigm of the ruling, you know, European approach to the world. Well, the, the, um, this was part of uh, the decision-making process that the UNE Queen um, wanted to go uh, in order to go within their own council to decide um, to travel to Europe because it was an invitation that we brought them from the mayor of, of Vienna, um, an official formal invitation. And we traveled all the way um, up to the Rio Blanco and uh, to this um, area where they live. And they are in this protected zone, uh, which is um, inaccessible unless you have all the right permits. So they do live under the protection of the visit world at the time, inclusive in government. And um, the, this was our decision with an astronaut or with the, our Brazilian artist who's been working with them for decades and who has um, really an engagement with them. And when we wanted to do the exhibition with an astronaut, <coughs> I very quickly realized that the only way to engage with him at that point in his life was to embrace this uh, partnership with the Unico. And apart from being uh, incredibly creative artists themselves, they also you know, have the knowledge of the foresta and the medicinal plants, and not only Alawash, that's a secret plant, but all of their other knowledge. So there was also a book that was published, which raised a lot of controversy because they are not the only indigenous tribe who have this knowledge. Um, but they were supported by some um, research group from the Botanical Garden Institute of Rio, and they published this medicinal book. Um, there was a sort of a guide on how to use these different plants, and we wanted them to come to Europe to not only share that knowledge, but also to help us reconnect to nature in the way that we have, as Europeans, as you said, we're completely not. We're sitting in a lit, air conditioned room. We're actually at the same type of environment with those decisions. And I spent, I don't know, the last few days at COP, and I get the worst, I mean, you just start to feel completely a claustrophobic, and you have no access to light, daylight, or any fresh air, and it is in these completely artificial environments that these decisions have been taken. So it's very important for us, was when we invited them over, that they helped us through a number of their knowledge systems to have, share with us the me forest, uh, I'm the forest, the forest is me, and this connection to nature, which otherwise, before this, sounded like such an abstract concept to me. Um, they really were able to share their knowledge. It was a very sort of fine line that we tried to keep, you know, because we really don't want to exotify uh, such incredible people with such an incredible knowledge system. This was not about us teaching them anything, it was about inviting them to come and teach us their traditions and their knowledge system. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I don't know if I explain this Not that as well as I could. So, and, and taking the wrong words, you know, on a, on a society that is detached from nature because of the way the decisions they took and the way civilization, you know, expand, how can you really say something that, you know, people are not that connected or, you know, maybe it's just a theory and a, and a theory. Yeah, that's what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to make a point in this. In this. Uh, I mean, we all humans have the ability to connect with nature because we come from there, it's just in, in, in us. But what we see on all of these discussions, you know, coming from a Latin country and being exposed also to, to the gifts of nature, is that there is a, a very strong analysis, and, you know, like defragmented. All the actions, everything is fragmented. So they're trying to speak something that they haven't really embraced as a in a in a personal experience. So it's kind of a tricky. Who's they in this case? Well, they ask the Europeans. No, no. Basically, uh, if you want to be in charge of uh, one of these large institutions, if you have one of a powerful role in this game, uh, is that you have a pact. And this path is not really, you know, being exposed to this nature and embrace this knowledge as an experience. So it's a little bit tricky to claim that, you know, Europeans should lead the, the, the world and to, to save nature if Europeans are still in the process of reconnecting with nature. So I think it should be a way more open conversation in which all this Asian knowledge can be shared with the decision makers through experience. Because it's not about someone telling someone else how to uh, fix it. It's by showing. It's by really, it's through experience. So okay. I thank you all. <laughs> thank you very much for your point. I think it's really important to what you're saying. And uh, I think it might just be my opportunity to wrap this session up. Um, I just wanted to not to confuse me with the powerful, or the powerful person who has the right to make decisions. I'm a cultural practitioner. Um, I've been engaging for many years, as we saw at the beginning, you know, in commissioning works and or acquiring works. But in, from my point of view, dealt that important message. And why? Because artists since the Renaissance times have been the antennas of our time. They have been able to translate Great and important visions, and, and the, you know, go around this museum on the top floor. You see that in the 13th century, 14th century, Christ and all religious figures are always painted on a blonde and background. And it took until the late 14th century, 15th century, to be able to incorporate these sacred images into a landscape that was real, so that humans and mankind began to relate to the sacred images because they were placed inside. And so since this Renaissance time, I think the artists have been step, stepping forward um, in order to convey um, this very, very important message of changes in our society. And that's where I think um, we came to Daisy and to, to John this evening. And I thank you all for coming here tonight. And I'm really very, very grateful for those of you who stayed until the very end. And um, I want to thank my co panelists for doing this, John and Daisy, for coming here today, and especially to Soledad for having. Into, oh, you <coughs> wanted to wrap up the panel, so is it, I'm sorry, I'm taking up in your position to wrap this up. <coughs> um, but thank you really for, for having faith that I really do believe that art has a powerful <coughs> agency of change. It can make a difference, and this is something that is quite strong in today's contemporary art world. And as practitioners of that, we really want to give our support and give these strong messages through our cultural language. Because this is not a problem that can only be solved by certain problem solvers or people in a position to do so. Everybody in every single walk of life, whatever, whatever discipline they have, has to contribute to this conversation because we really do need to leave the oil in the ground. Thank you very much.